Welcome to our webinar. Our topic today is an overview of engineered wood products. My name is Mary Ewer, and I'm the Eastern Region Manager for APA, the Engineered Wood Association Field Services Division. I will serve as the moderator for the session today. APA is a nonprofit trade association representing manufacturers of a variety of common structural engineered wood products. In addition to quality verification and product testing, APA conducts research to improve engineered wood products and systems where they're used. We also educate users and specifiers on the product's intended use and potential applications. Before we start the webinar, I need to cover a few housekeeping details. Warren's presentation will last about 50 minutes. After the conclusion of the webinar, you can get customized certificates of completion for this course. Our class today is approved for both AIA and ICC continuing education credit, and a certificate will be provided for all attendees to use for other professions or organizations that self-report continuing education. Your feedback is important to us. I would like to point out that you see a QR code on your screen. If you open the camera on your smartphone, a link will pop up to take you to the survey on this session. We will show you this link a few more times throughout the course today. Our presenter today is Warren Hamrick. Warren is an engineered wood specialist for APA, the Engineered Wood Association, serving the Southeastern United States. Warren consults with and conducts workshops for designers, code officials, and other building professionals on best practices for specification, selection, and application of engineered wood products. And I will now turn the microphone over to our speaker, Warren Hamrick. All right, thanks, Mary, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, before we jump in, I wanted to give just a, a little bit of, of my background. I have a civil engineering degree with a focus on structures from North Carolina State University. Uh, I've been with APA now uh, a little over five years. And prior to joining APA, I worked as a uh, project manager for a uh, structural engineering firm which focused on commercial construction. So today our training objectives are on your screen. Um, you know what we want to do today is talk about engineered wood products obviously. We are going to uh, identify the various types of engineered wood products that are uh, commonly used in the field today. We're going to talk about some of the features of those products and you know, some of the benefits of using the products, go over some of their significant characteristics. And then one of the most important things I think is we want to recognize the appropriate application for each product. I mean, we want, we want engineered wood products to be used obviously, but we want them to be used in the right application. Uh, so at the end of the day, everybody's happy with what they have. So let's start off uh, and we're going to talk about what qualifies as an engineered wood product and then go over some of the reasons designers and contractors prefer engineered wood. We'll also talk, um, you know, at, at a basic level of the basic manufacturing processes for each uh, engineered wood product and then get into uh, more specifics about each type. So starting with what is an engineered wood product? You know, engineered wood could be described as any wood-based building material that's been improved physically through a man-made process. And, you know, our, our engineered wood products, we're going to go over quite a few today. They generally can be divided into two categories. You have panel products and then framing. And, you know, at... At APA, we talk a lot about wood structural panels, and wood structural panels include plywood and OSB. And you know, that makes a lot of sense for us. You know, APA uh, originally stood for the American Plywood Association. And then, you know, talking about oriented strand board, it was invented in 1965. At that point, it was called wafer board. And then during the 1970s, the um, the plywood lumber supply dropped and OSB became much more popular. And over the years, these panel products have expanded to include uh, more specialized products. And we'll touch on a few of those today. 
moving on to the uh, framing category, you know, these engineered wood products are used in a variety of applications. So let's start with wood eye joists. You know, wood eye joists are typically going to be used as floor joists uh, or roof rafters. We then have uh, an entire group of other products which we classify as uh, structural composite lumber or SCL. So structural composite lumber products, um, they're going to include parallel strand lumber, which is PSL. This is commonly used as a beam. We then have laminated veneer lumber or LVL. This also is most commonly used as a beam, but it also could be used as, as joists uh, or rim boards or occasionally as a stud. Next product is laminated strand lumber or LSL. Uh, that's commonly going to be used as a header or uh, or a stud. And then oriented, oriented strand lumber, OSL, that's commonly going to be used as a stud replacement. The next framing product is glue laminated timber or glue lamb. And that's typically going to be used as beams and columns. You know, in the field, I've actually seen all of these products used as headers over a wall opening. One thing to keep in mind with that is if you use an eye joist as a header, that's typically only appropriate at interior walls uh, where the horizontal load on the wall is minimal. So we just threw a lot of products at you uh, and we're gonna go over each of these and, and some of their differences today. A product that gets talked about quite a bit is a hot topic is cross laminated timber. So cross laminated timber or CLT, you know, it kind of uh, it kind of straddles the framing and panel category. So you know, one of the things I've heard one of my colleagues say is if if glue lamb and plywood had a child, that child might be a CLT panel, and the idea for the CLT panel is to replace traditional joist and, sh and sheathing assemblies with a solid wood floor plate. So, you know, we mentioned the similarity to glue lamb. Uh, like glue lamb, CLT is made from, from sewn lumber pieces, which are stacked on top of each other. Now, unlike glue lamb, the orientation of the wood grain changes throughout the depth of the panel. And that's it, that. That's similar to plywood, and just like plywood, um, you know, CLT panels they're going to have a strong axis span direction. For your information, right now, cross laminated timber is currently approved for gravity framing. So, uh, if you were going to use CLT for lateral load resistance, this typically is going to require the engineer to use the uh, alternate means route which is provided in the code. Now, what you'll see uh, often is engineers use other materials on top of CLT, and that's usually gonna be a wood structural panel like plywood or OSB, and this will give them the diaphragm capacity that they need. So why, why choose engineered wood products? Well, you know, from, from talking to our contacts in the field, there's generally four main reasons that designers and builders uh, will turn to engineered wood. And those are sustainability, predictability, performance, and waste reduction. Wood is the most common uh, naturally renewable building material. And you know, engineered wood even takes this a step further by maximizing the strength of the material and using smaller pieces of wood to actually create larger members. Wood product manufacturing also consumes less energy than other building products. So zero net carbon, uh, which is a, a particularly hot topic in the market. Forests are natural carbon sinks so they take in carbon dioxide and they give off oxygen. And as the forest grows, carbon gets sequestered or, or stored uh, in the wood. When these forests get old and begin to decay, carbon dioxide is released. And you know, 
today we're using second and even third generation trees to make wood products. Despite the constant use of wood over the years, we now have substantially more forest in the US than we did 100 years ago. And if, if this topic is something that, uh, that interests you and you wanna dig in a little bit deeper, many of you may be aware of Katie Fernholtz. Um, she's with Dovetail Partners and is a board member of the American Forest Foundation. She did a very interesting presentation for us on wood as a sustainable material. This can be found in the webinar section of apawood.org. She laid out a lot of numbers which were pretty eye-opening to me. They were, they were surprising, uh, and it's a very interesting webinar. I, I would highly recommend you taking a look. Predictability. Engineered wood products are very predictable, and this is both in, in dimensions and performance. And this is because they're designed and manufactured to uh, maximize the natural strength and stiffness of the wood with durable moisture resistant adhesive and minimal shrinkage. Consistent dimensions are typically a big advantage for contractors because they don't need to make continuous adjustments for warped pieces of lumber. Column and beam products are produced in long sections of 48 feet or longer and can be custom cut to meet a nearly unlimited variety of applications. All of these products are manufactured to meet internationally recognized standards with consistent design values supported by continuous quality control with third party oversight. On top of the dimensional stability, you know, engineered wood is typically available in longer lengths which results in fewer pieces to purchase and gives you increased design flexibility. Because in this process, we're disassembling a tree, uh, removing some of the normal imperfections and then reassembling, these products can outperform sawn lumber. Long lengths and uh, also, pre-cut framing packages uh, are going to result in less waste, which impacts the amount of material going to landfills. And for the contractor, you know, this could also result in uh, reduced disposal costs. When using conventional framing lumber, as much as 10% of the primary framing members are rejected due to excessive cupping, splitting, and warping. Engineered wood can typically eliminate this waste uh, because it is more dimensionally stable. So now let's take a few minutes to consider the, um, the manufacturing of engineered wood products and how it maximizes the structural value of our timber resource. You know, we noted earlier, uh, any engineered wood is any wood-based building material that has been improved physically through a man-made process. So let's dig into that process and take a look. So generally when manufacturing engineered wood, there are uh, six steps. So we, we're gonna we, have a, we start with a log, we're gonna take a log apart, sort the pieces, apply adhesives, arrange the pieces in a specific fashion, which we'll talk about. This, will then need to be pressed and allowed to cure, and then any finishing touches will be added. A couple of the products um, that we'll talk about today, uh, wood eye joists and high strength glue lamb beams, which have LVL flanges, these are gonna require uh, more steps because they are actually a combination of products. So step one, we need to take the log apart. So this is done a few different ways um, depending on the, the end product. So slicing is the first one we'll talk about. That produces flakes. Um, peeling uh, the log is gonna produce veneers. And then sawing is gonna get a solid piece of wood. So if you think about uh, which product uses uh, each of those different materials or, or different types of uh, cut wood, it's, it's actually pretty easy to identify, uh, especially the ones that start with slicing the logs into flakes. You know, you can usually see the flakes on the surface of the final product. 
and these uh, can typically be made with smaller diameter trees than the ones used for sawn lumber. And those sawn lumber pieces are what's used to create uh, glue lamb or CLT. And the, um, the sliced process can also usually be, uh, they also usually can use smaller diameter logs than what's used for peeling veneers. These raw wood laminations and strands are gonna be sorted by grade and dried. And that's so the uh, resins can effectively bond the laminations or strands together and create the structural members. Veneers and products like plywood, they can also be altered to increase the grade. So many of you have probably seen this. So if you've ever seen a uh, football shaped insert on a sheet of plywood, um, it's likely that the mill punched out a knot in order to um, increase the grade of the veneer. If we take a look at the photo near the middle of the screen, um, this is actually showing a technician visually grading veneers before they hit the oven to be dried out. The adhesives are applied to the laminations and strands uh, in a controlled manner. Uh, this is to assure a permanent bond. Now, the actual adhesives used, um, they do vary in composition but they're going to adhere to an ASTM standard. So when you have strong wood fiber plus durable moisture resistant resins, that's gonna equal high quality engineered wood products. In order to design a uh, durable high performance product using our wood resource, you have to take into consideration the natural properties of wood. The orientation of the grain and the wood laminations and strands is gonna impact the structural performance. And another consideration is that wood can move as it increases and decreases in moisture content. With engineered wood, the wood members will typically increase in size slightly following manufacture. And you know, wood is stronger when dried. And Another characteristic is, uh, you know, until we can, can grow trees without limbs and branches, there's going to be natural characteristics in the wood, such as knots and sloping grain, that, are, that can reduce its strength. Uh, all of these properties are addressed in the design of engineered wood products and systems. Wood is primarily made from um, parallel tubular structures. On a microscopic level, um, we can pretty closely model wood's behavior using a bundle of straws. So when compression is applied parallel to the grain, that straw bundle is gonna be strong and efficiently resist crushing. However, if the load is applied uh, perpendicular to the length of the straws, which is, this is something you hear pretty often, this is perpendicular to the grain, the straws crush more easily. And this, this is very similar to the way wood performs. Uh, and a lower force is required to cause crushing, which is failure, perpendicular to the grain. Keep in mind also that wood has uh, different strength properties in three different directions. So you have longitudinal and, and wood strong in that direction. Tangential is not as strong as, as longitudinal and radial is uh, the weakest. So looking at compression. So in compression, wood is utilized uh, vertically as studs, columns, and posts. Um, it can also be used in compression in truss assemblies. And this is like your top cord and then some of your web members. Compression applied perpendicular to the grain is weaker uh, than if applied parallel. And then that's what we just went over. It's gonna crush more readily. In tension, uh, wood performs well with the load applied parallel to the grain, as long as the grain is straight and there are minimum uh, knots and other strength reducing characteristics. This is the most demanding application for wood performance and these applications in general are gonna require high, higher quality uh, members than compression members. When wood decreases in moisture content, the walls and the tubular shape 
uh, wood cells are going to shrink. And this is going to cause the uh, wood to decrease in dimension in both thickness and width. In wood science vernacular, the shrinkage that occurs perpendicular to the growth rings is called radial shrinkage. Shrinkage that is parallel or tangent to the growth rings of the wood is tangential shrinkage. Tangential shrinkage averages about twice that of radial shrinkage in most species. Shrinkage in the length of the wood or longitudinal shrinkage is negligible. In most construction lumber, the, um, the growth rings are going to be parallel to the wide face. And that explains why solid sewn lumber floor joists, uh, they generally shrink in depth as they dry to a stable moisture content, which is what would normally be found inside the completed structure. When we look at uh, oriented strand board or OSB, I think a lot of people uh, don't realize that OSB has layers, uh, just like plywood. Unlike plywood, the wood grain in any one layer is uh, more randomized. And this slightly more random orientation actually gives OSB panels a slight edge when it comes to stiffness in plane. Both OSB and plywood uh, undergo structural tests in both their wet and dry conditions. Plywood typically will adhere to the PS1 product standard, which is prescriptive. OSB and other wood sheathing products adhere to PS2, which is a performance standard. Now, for your information, there are some plywood that is manufactured to the PS2 standard. The reason this is done, it gives the mill a bit more flexibility in terms of the raw materials, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's totally appropriate. Moving on to uh, siding. So APA siding is available with a wide variety of patterns and finishes. All of the adhesives used in the siding are moisture resistant with an exterior bond classification. And the panels are designed to be impact resistant um, for wind blown debris. So here in the, in the Carolinas, uh, one of the most popular specialty products that I see used uh, frequently is radiant barrier sheathing. Radiant barrier uh, sheathing is uh, it's basically a wood structural panel with a reflective coating on one side. Um, these are used as roof sheathing uh, in a lot of residential structures to improve energy performance. Sheathing can also be used for um, concrete formwork. Realistically, um, you could use any exterior grade panel for formwork, but many manufacturers now produce specialty panels with pre-applied quick release coatings. Uh, there are also panels manufactured with overlays that provide an improved, um, you're gonna get an improved concrete finish. And also you'll, uh, you'll be able to increase the lifespan of the panel. The overlay panels that are commonly used in concrete forming are high density overlay and medium density overlay. These are commonly referred to as HDO and MDO. Um, these overlays, um, they're bonded to the plywood under high heat and pressure. And then we have industrial panels uh, and overlay panels that are also uh, manufactured similar to basic plywood or OSB with just slight adjustments that tailor them to their specific end use. And this can be something like cabinets or, or uh, crates. So let's now move on to our framing products. So as you can see on your screen, there's a lot of acronyms. We speak in acronyms on a regular basis, so I'm going to try to uh, minimize the acronyms. I'm going to use the full name quite a lot to hopefully uh, make it uh, easier to follow. Because some of these sound quite a bit the same, uh, so I'll try to, to pretty frequently use the whole name. The first one we're going to start with is wood eye joists. 
And this is where we can start to see how uh, the iJoyce optimized the wood resource. Uh, and they're in the shape of a letter I. So these eye joists are used to span between supports as floor joists or roof rafters. And when that's happened, the bending forces are carried on the top and bottom flanges. Eye joists can also be used for uh, rim board, headers. We have an example a little later on of a eye joist used as a stud. Uh, the flanges are going to be manufactured either from uh, laminated veneer lumber, which is LVL, or machine stress rated lumber. And we'll get into LVL in, a, in more detail in a few minutes. In order to uh, precisely determine the performance of the lumber flanges, that lumber is not only visually graded, as is most construction lumber, but it's going to be stress rated by specialized equipment. Uh, to determine the lumber's ability to resist bending forces. And then your web material is typically going to be a 3 8 inch oriented strand board or OSB. The flanges and web material are both specifically manufactured for use as components in eye joists. So we talked about the efficient use of the wood fiber and that efficient use creates a joist that not only contains 36% less wood than dimension lumber, uh, two by tens and two by twelves, but it's also stiffer and stronger. Eye joists and other engineered wood products make optimum use of the resource by putting high strength wood only where it's most needed. Another advantage of wood eye joists um, is the flange width. So the flange width is often wider than nominal lumber. So why is that an advantage? Well, it's going to provide a larger target for fasteners to hit uh, when you're sheathing floors or roofs with wood structural panels. Um, we often see fasteners miss framing members and just providing that larger target is an advantage. Another thing, these lighter weight joists also come in long lengths and that can make uh, handling easier. Uh, it can also have the possibility of running a single joist from the front wall of a building all the way to the rear wall. Eye joists are typically manufactured in four common depths, and these are uh, nine and a half inches, 11 and seven eighths, 14 inch, and 16 inch. And then, you know, like, like many other, those are your common depths. There are manufacturers that produce uh, other depths as well. All APA eye joists uh, are gonna meet the PRI 400 performance standard at a minimum. Now, many eye joist manufacturers, uh, they make products that exceed the PRI 400 minimums, and they'll have uh, proprietary APA product reports or ICC ES ESR reports. This information came from a 2019 builder survey. Home builders chose iJoyce framing for use on about 46% of the raised single family floors in the US. And there's, you know, there's many reasons for this consistent popularity of iJoyce uh, floor assemblies. And if we look at the rest of the data, uh, solid lumber is used in about a third of residential floors, and wood trusses are about 20%. And if you're wondering what the 2% other, um, you know, that would be things like steel framing and structural insulated panels. Because engineered uh, wood floor and roof systems use low moisture content, eye joists, structural composite lumber, and rim board materials, it's recommended not to mix lumber into that system. This is for two reasons. It's because of the potential shrinkage of the lumber and the potential uh, minor expansion of the eye joist, for instance. It should also be noted that eye joists and lumber are going to have different depths, and this can lead to continuity issues. There's an example in this picture. In this picture, a framer used a solid lumber rim board with an eye joist floor system. And this is an issue. Uh, the depths don't match. 
Starting in the 2012 International Residential Code, or IRC, it started to include fire protective membrane requirements to uh, enhance the fire performance of residential floor systems. APA has a wealth of information about designing uh, iJoyce floor systems to meet the IRC requirements. And this includes a recorded webinar you can watch uh, online as well as we have downloadable publications and we have CAD details. So if you want more, uh, if you have questions, you want more information on this, you can visit uh, the URL on your screen, apawood.org slash iJoyceFireAssemblies. And that's where all of this information is available and, and it's all completely free like everything else from us. So an engineered wood floor system, uh, we talked about it offering value. Uh, it offers values in many ways to the builder. So I joys create a, uh, a flat system with all of the components exactly the same depth. So this allows the connection between the joists and the subfloor panels to be more direct by providing a, um, it, it gives you a, a smooth uniform surface and that's where you can apply the continuous bead of adhesive and your fasteners. And this helps ensure that all of the floor components are securely connected and move together as a single unit. And as we all know, when we have issues, uh, it's often the independent movement of components uh, in our floor system. And that's what can create your noises, your squeaks, and it, it also uh, creates uneven floor surfaces. So positive connections of these components result in reduced callbacks. And this not only, uh, callbacks are not only headaches for a builder, but ultimately they impact profitability. Eye joists are consistent in size, uh, straightness, and strength, and provide consistent performance within a floor, which leads to flatter and quieter floor assemblies. With today's rapidly increasing energy code requirements, it can be more important than ever for ductwork to be in the condition space of the building. Uh, and that's in the condition space rather than in an attic or a crawl space. With properly designed ductwork running through the floor system, there's less wasted energy and uh, greater confidence in meeting the requirements of the energy code. As shown in this picture, the ability to cut appropriate sized and positioned holes in eye joists facilitate the running of ductwork perpendicular to the joists. Another advantage of eye joist floor systems is the possibility of increasing the spacing between the joists. This allows for uh, larger ductwork to run between the framing members. These opportunities are only maximized with the cooperation of the floor designer and, the, and your mechanical team. And, you know, this is a challenge, but coordination between trades is always critical, and it's very critical uh, in this instance. I-Joycer are often going to be paired with laminated veneer lumber, uh, which is LVL, which is often used as beams and headers. Laminated veneer lumber, um, it's the most widely used type of structural composite lumber. It uses um, specially selected ultrasonically graded veneers and orients all of the veneers with the grain running lengthwise. The veneers are then lap jointed to create long lengths. Aligning the grain parallel to the span in this way, uh, what it does is it maximizes the bending and axial strength while minimizing shrinkage. So our LVL or laminated veneer lumber uh, beams are commonly made in depths which match the depths of eye joists. Wider LVLs, deeper LVLs are also available. The most common thickness is an inch and three quarter, but uh, LVL is available in thicknesses up to seven inches. They're commonly available in 1.5E, 1.8E, and 2.0E in bending stiffness or modulus of elasticity. And the modulus of elasticity, uh, what that does is measures the object's ability to resist being deformed. 
So on your screen now are two uh, slightly less common members of the structural composite lumber uh, family. First is laminated strand lumber or LSL. So LSL uses strands uh, and these strands have a ratio of about 150 times their thickness. These products that where you're going to commonly see this as uh, rim boards, wall studs, and probably most commonly headers. Next is oriented strand lumber, and this is very similar, but uses shorter strands that are around 75 times their thickness. Generally, if you see OSL, it's gonna be as a, a wall stud replacement. Both uh, laminated strand lumber and oriented strand lumber uh, are manufactured in iJoyce compatible depths. Their common thicknesses are uh, inch and a quarter, inch and a half, inch and three quarter and three and a half. Their common stiffness values or modulus of elasticities are 1.3 E and 1.5 E. So you may have noticed, um, you know, these are not quite as stiff as the laminated veneer lumber we discussed earlier. So, uh, and as always, check with the manufacturer for additional information on structural characteristics and also availability. Parallel strand lumber, or PSL, is manufactured from veneers that are clipped into long strands and bonded together in a parallel formation. So once again, the grain is running in the direction of the length of the beam to, uh, to maximize the bending strength. The strands, uh, they're cut into lengths that are around 300 times their thickness. This product is, is uh, very commonly used as beams. That's the most common application, but it can also be used as uh, headers, uh, studs, and rim board. At this time, this product uh, is proprietary to one manufacturer. PSL is, is gonna be manufactured in the same depths as iJoyce and LVL and thicknesses of an inch and three quarter, three and a half, five and a quarter, and seven inches. The members are also manufactured with similar structural characteristics as the higher strength uh, laminated veneer lumber. So this gives you 29 PSI in bending and 2.0 E in bending stiffness or modulus of elasticity. Our last framing product that we're gonna talk about is glue laminated timbers or glue lamb. Glue lamb's gonna use layers of uh, inch and a half or inch and three eighths lumber, and these are gonna be bonded together in a flat stack. You'll notice a common theme with our framing products. The wood grain is gonna run parallel to the length of the beam, which you know that's very similar to the other structural composite lumber products. Like the iJoyce uh, glue lamb, they, they are strategic with the placement of, uh, of your higher strength material. And that's going to be at the, uh, you're going to put the higher strength material at the top and the bottom of the member. So when you see a glue lamb, it, it may look like it's the same kind of laminations all the way through, but that's usually not the case. These can also be used, glue lamb can also be used for beams, headers, studs, and columns. Glue lamb's also available in uh, iJoyce compatible depths and common thicknesses of three and a half, five and a half, and six and three quarter. So if you notice these uh, first two thicknesses are gonna flush out with your two by four and two by six studs. And as with the other engineered wood products, um, they are readily available in lengths up to 48 feet. The most common structural designation for glue lamb is a strength of 2,400 uh, pounds per square inch or PSI in bending and a stiffness or modulus of elasticity of 1.8 E. Uh, glue lamb can be custom made in to just about any shape or length, um, which gives them a pretty unique advantage if you uh, are working on a project with uh, some complex geometry. In some parts of the country, uh, hybrid glue lamb beams are manufactured uh, to meet the high stiffness 
that's being produced by some of the other structural composite lumber products. Glue lamb manufacturers developed a high strength glue lamb beam that married traditional solid sawn plies with high strength LVL located on the outer plies, giving us the, the best of both glue lamb and LVL worlds. These hybrid beams use LVL top and bottom laminations uh, to increase their tensile strength. It not only increases the strength of a traditional 24F 1.8E uh, glue lamb, but it's now the strongest beam available on, a mar on the market with uh, values of 30F and 2.1E. These come in conventional glue lamb depths as well as iJoyce compatible depths. Now, Take note, this, this may not be uh, readily available as a stock item, so that's something to keep in mind. Interest in using engineered wood products in Type 3 construction has been rising in recent years. Type 3 construction is the type of construction in which the exterior walls um, are going to be non-combustible materials and the interior of the building can be made from any material permitted by code. Fire retardant treated wood framing is permitted within the exterior wall assembly of a two hour rating or less. So in order to address this opportunity, APA and the USDA Forest Products Laboratory work to develop ASTM standards for the evaluation of FRT glue lamb and LVL. Recently, APA published a technical topic summarizing the results of this pilot test program examining the structural properties of FRT glue lamb. For structural design, the actual treatment and hydrothermal effects on the glue lamb properties should be obtained from the treater who provided the fire retardant treatment. Recently, FRT LVL uh, has hit the market, and APA just released a similar tech note on fire retardant treatment for LVL. So now that we've gone over the common engineered wood products used in the field, let's let's take a look at how they're used. Uh, so here, eye joists are being used as a repetitive floor joist member. Note in the foreground, the eye joists are hanging from a glue lamb beam, which is supported by a glue lamb column. The eye joists in the background are used as floor joists in a continuous span over an intermittent bearing wall. And you can also notice the underside of the OSB sheathing, which is running perpendicular to the eye joist framing. Often LVL or laminated veneer lumber beams are used in hidden or flush beam applications. So here the eye joists are supporting the floor above and in turn being supported by lightweight metal joist hangers on each side of the LVL beam. This is what manufacturers mean by eye joist combat compatible. The beam is the same depth as the floor joist so that when the ceiling is applied to the bottom of the eye joist, the beam's gonna be fully concealed. This glue lamb is being used to support eye joist floors. All of the beams are top loaded, but you can see a very large hanger is supporting the glue lamb that is hanging on the other glue lamb. And unlike the previous example, uh, here we're relying on direct bearing of the eye joist on the glue lamb instead of metal hangers. Here we see a grid of LVL floor beams being positioned in a large house. You know, you can note that uh, in some cases the LVL beams are being used to support other LVL or laminated veneer lumber beams that are being installed perpendicular to the lower beams. This is showing a uh, parallel strand lumber or PSL beam, and it's being used to carry the end, uh, end of a span of roof trusses. You can really see how unique looking those long thin strands appear. And occasionally you may see a, a parallel strand lumber beam that's exposed at interior spaces at, and used basically as an architectural feature. 
In this photo, we once again uh, see eye joists used as repetitive members um, being supported by lightweight metal hangers on the side of the glue lamb beam at the ridge and at the exterior walls. In this application, the eye joists are being used in a simple span or single span condition. Uh, and in this case, the eye joists are being used as a cathedral ceiling. And this is going to be supporting both. This is a, it's a cathedral ceiling rafter uh, on a gable type roof, and it's going to be supporting both the roof and the ceiling loads. Here we see a uh, LVL being used as a header uh, to carry the load over an opening in a wall. And, you know, from the side, this, this looks a lot like plywood. Uh, but unlike plywood, all of the wood grain in these, again, is going to be oriented in the long direction. LVL headers are also commonly found in longer spans, and here we see a, uh, a double car garage. So it's likely that a, a header of this length is either a, a thick, like a, a three and a half inch thick uh, LVL, or possibly two laminations of laminated veneer lumber fastened together. Engineered wood is straight and it's relatively light, uh, which can make uh, installation like this pretty efficient. And here's a very similar garage, a double car garage, and they're using glue lamp for the same application. So this is where it's it's important to understand that there's there's a variety of options for most applications. I mean, this header also likely could have been an LVL or a PSL header. This photo we see uh, circled LVL being used as a column, and this is actually an eye joist studded wall system. So this is a pretty interesting application. At this time, APA has no published recommendations on the use of eye joists in vertical applications. That doesn't mean you can't do it. The use of such, such a, a system could be done following engineering principles and also discussions with the eye joist manufacturer. This photo is showing two laminated strand lumber headers and they're being used as a, uh, a short support beam for a wall above. So this wall, you can see several different engineered wood products being used. So in this application, uh, OSL is actually being used as the, the top wall plate and the framing around the rough opening. Also note the, uh, the eye joists and LVL studs in this thick wall assembly. And we often see um, LSL and LVL studs used in walls 12 foot high and greater. Um, and this is because of their uh, ability to be manufactured into larger lengths, their straightness and their bending strength. In this photo, we uh, are seeing parallel strand lumber used in a tall wall application, and it's the PSL is being used for both vertical and horizontal members. This two and a half story uh, window wall is being supported by glue lamb vertical columns and horizontal beams. And when we think back to how glue lamb and other structural composite lumber products are manufactured, you know, they could theoretically be produced in infinite lengths. Now, this obviously is not practical, uh, and there are two main reasons it's not practical. Uh, one, the lengths would be limited to the capacity of the manufacturing facility. And second, um, you know, these products actually have to be shipped to the job site. So that's going to be a limiting factor as well. Engineered wood products that, um, that bear the APA trademark are manufactured in accordance with APA or national standards. The trademark is the manufacturer's assurance that the product conforms to the standards noted on that trademark. APA members commit to a rigorous program of quality inspections and testing. 
many engineered wood products uh, are also proprietary and, and use proprietary engineering standards reports and APA product reports. Uh, and these reports are used for code recognition, product use, and design information. And here's a picture of an APA product report. So these reports are going to uh, indicate that the product meets the intention of the building code when used as identified in the report. Project reports are going to identify the specific design uses and limitations, uh, as well as the design properties. And these reports are available for free download uh, on the APA website at apawood.org. I think it's important for all of us involved in the uh, wood products industry to understand how remarkably earth friendly the products that we promote are. Wood and, you know, more specifically engineered wood is a renewable building material and is a good choice for the environment, also for green building and for uh, long term life cycle performance. With intensified interest in environmental impact and green building, it's important to consider these attributes. So shown on the slide, you know, you have approximately a third of the U.S. is forested. Uh, about 500 million acres are open to logging. And, and one of the, the main things, takeaways from this is the volume of forest growth is currently two times higher than the volume of the annual harvest. Engineered wood products can be manufactured from uh, small dimension lumber, as well as utilize many different species of wood. And that makes these products resource efficient. By strategically placing the wood fibers where they are, uh, they're most needed, these products maximize the use of the material. Um, the industrial output per unit of wood input has increased 40% in the last 50 years. Many of APA's member manufacturers have developed green verification reports. These reports help building officials and design professionals determine a product's eligibility for points under recognized green building standards. APA issues these reports to document the compliance of an engineered wood product that's manufactured under a quality program. So this is our last slide before the Q&A session. So I'm gonna to go back to uh, the question from the beginning. So why use engineered wood products? Uh, we mentioned there are four main reasons designers and builders typically turn to engineered wood. It's sustainable. Uh, we're able to use, uh, the manufacturers are able to use small dimension lumber. Predictable, uh, going to have less movement, less shrinkage. Performance, um, you know, it can be lighter, can be manufactured to longer lengths, and then uh, less waste. And that's where we get into the efficient use of, uh, of the wood fiber in the manufacturing of these products. And with that, uh, I believe Mary has been uh, monitoring questions and I am going to kick it back to her. I have been, Warren. Thank you very much. Uh, before we start our q and I'd like to remind our attendees that your feedback on today's webinar counts. Um, the QR code shown on our screen will link you to, to today's survey. Just open your camera on your smartphone and a link will take you straight to that survey when you point it at the code on the screen. Uh, this will stay up for all of our Q&A, so you have a little bit of time to pull it up on your phone or smart device and take a minute and fill out our survey. And like I said, thank you, Warren. We have had quite a few questions come in while you were speaking. Alita and I have answered a lot of them, but we do have a couple for you as well. Um, you mentioned that panel products are manufactured to standards. Um, can you explain the difference between PS1 and PS2 a little bit more? Sure. Um, so as you mentioned, the standards are PS1, which is currently PS119, and PS2, which is uh, currently PS218. 
So basically, PS1 is a prescriptive standard, and that's only going to cover structural plywood. So OSB is not going to be under the uh, PS1 standard. Uh, this standard is going to cover things like um, wood species, uh, veneer grading, adhesive bonds, uh, things like that. Uh, then PS2, that is where OSB is going to fall, and, and plywood also can be under PS2. Uh, uh, we mentioned, I believe, it, it just gives the manufacturer a little more flexibility in the, uh, the wood resource. And there is a uh, Canadian counterpart. It is, um, it is CSA 0325. So PS2 is a, um, is a performance standard. So it's a little bit different than the prescriptive. And it's going to, uh, it's also going to look at things like panel construction, workmanship, dimensions, tolerances. It's just uh, uh, the main difference is PS1 is prescriptive, PS2 is performance, and PS1 will only cover uh, structural plywood. Great, thank you. When OSB is used as wall or roof sheathing, how long can it be exposed? Wow, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a good question and a really <laughs> common question that we get. And unfortunately, there's no easy answer, so that's why we get the question so much. So the, the majority of your uh, wall and roof sheathing products in the market are going to be uh, exposure one bond classification. So that means they are not meant to be continuously, uh, they're not meant to be exposed to moisture continuously through their life cycle. Now, we all know as you go buy a house that's under construction, you're going to see sheathing exposed and, and it can be rained on. That's okay with the exposure one bond classification. The, they're basically meant for uh, only exposed to moisture under normal construction schedule. Now that's where it gets difficult because if it's exposed in Phoenix, Arizona versus Seattle, Washington, that can be quite a different uh, animal. Uh, so there's not an easy answer. It's just um, exposed for a normal construction schedule. One thing that I will uh, kind of expand on that a little bit is where we see a lot of issues is if panels, especially floor panels, get really wet, make sure they don't get loaded. Uh, they're really resilient if allowed to dry out. But if things like drywall carts roll over them while they're wet, that can damage fibers, that can give, uh, create soft spots, and then you, you do have a problem at that point. Okay, great. Um, the next question, if the panels need to be spaced an eighth of an inch, do we have to trim the panels in the field? Uh, you don't necessarily. Uh, most panels are manufactured slightly less than uh, the, tra the, uh, the traditional, let's just say if you're looking at a four by eight uh, panel, they're manufactured slightly smaller than that. And if you look at the trademark stamp, they'll often be uh, marked sized for spacing. That being said, uh, the eighth of an inch space is uh, critical to allow the panels to expand as they acclimate. So it's possible that, uh, you know, I, I don't think it would be very often, rarely, you may have to field trim a panel in order to get that eighth of an inch space. Great. Um, thank you again, Warren. Before we conclude, I did want to touch on a few quick things. Make sure you're signed up to receive our APA update newsletter so that you will be notified of future webinars and updates to APA publications and standards. To receive it, all you need to do from our homepage is click on sign in in the upper right hand corner of the page. In the drop down menu, simply select register, and then you'll need to let us know what you would like to receive from APA. In this case, that's the APA update newsletter. And lastly, APA has field staff located throughout the country. These talented people are available to assist design professionals, builders, and code officials. Their individual contact information can be found on our website, apawood.org. Please feel free to reach out and take advantage of this free resource. Don't forget to download your AIA or ICC Certificate of Completion. And with that, I'd like to thank you for attending. 
Have a great day.